All right, everyone. Welcome to Vision Expo and welcome to the Covalent Careers and New Grad Optometry booth where we're doing pop-up talks all week. This one is on practice marketing. It's going to be how to improve your marketing 10x. We've got myself, Dr. Matt Geller. I'm the founder of New Grad Optometry and the co-founder of Covalent Careers. And next to me, we have Dr. Jen Lyerly. She is an optometrist in North Carolina. Additionally, she's the co-founder of Defocus Media. Uh, they focus on, they have a, a really great industry-leading podcast. And in addition to that, um, they're doing some really great niche social media marketing for practices. To the left of Jen, we've got uh, Michael Pope. And hey. Michael is uh, the COO of iCare Pro. So iCare Pro does practice websites. They do a phenomenal job. When I was practicing in San Diego, we actually use their services really, really good uh, across the board practice websites and marketing. Um, in addition, uh, Michael is the founder of Energize, which is an alliance of corporate optometrists, and they do a phenomenal job industry leading work. So, welcome, guys. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah. I'm really excited to talk about social media marketing, but also all types of marketing because yeah. there's more than just social media. We were talking earlier. Absolutely. It's, a, it's really a, a topic I think that's a void by a lot of private practitioners, core practitioners. They tend to say, I need to see patients. That's where I've got to be and I've got a demanding schedule and maybe if time allows for it during lunch, I'll make a Facebook post or maybe I'll stay late on a Friday or come in on a Saturday to do some marketing. And I think it's uh, one of those things that's potentially not taught enough in school and that's overlooked. And then we look at our results at the end of a quarter, at the end of the year, and we say, why don't we have that growth that we want so badly? Why aren't the sales there? And potentially it comes back to this idea of, well, really, what are you spending on marketing? Or not even spending, what are you actually putting towards it? Because not all marketing costs money. It can cost some of your time, of course. So what are you guys doing at your practice that um, has been low-hanging fruit marketing for you guys? I think you've got to start on Facebook. If you don't have a Facebook page, you're really missing out on one of the easiest ways to capture new patients. Um, your Facebook marketing doesn't have to be a big time commitment. A lot of studies out there suggest that if you have a smaller number of followers, under a thousand followers, maybe just two to three posts per week, that's all you need to commit to it and you're still going to have great results. It's not about likes, it's about engagement. So even if you've got two or three people that have liked and followed your page, if they're actively engaging in your posts, you're winning. Websites also, good place to start. Not expensive, easy way to get your point across. We assume that the consumers know what we know about eye care. And the fact is that any aspect of medicine, we have to be out educating our market on a regular basis about what exactly does eye care entail? What does it mean? And what does it mean to you specifically? So no more the general statements about, I do eye care for everyone because I don't know if you're talking to me, and I don't know what you're talking about. And so marketing is that means, whether it's through Facebook or a website or print media, that I'm gonna tell that story a little bit at a time, hoping that some aspect, some chapter of my story is going to engage you and draw you into my practice. Sure, so okay, so I like where this is going. Now, I think before we get into that stuff, because we're, we're, we're almost a little bit up here, we, we've gotta go, we gotta go even higher. So I would suggest for any practice getting started, whether you don't do this or do this even a little bit, meaning marketing, you have to start with your goal in mind, whether that's a quarterly goal or your yearly goal. So the first thing is determining what is your goal for that year, then breaking that down into quarterly goals. And then that's where you can really get, how is my marketing going to actually look and feel and function on a monthly level? So we know our yearly goal, we can break it down into quarterly goals, we communicate with, that, with our staff, we get our staff on board, everyone rallying towards this main North Star, and then we can get into tactical things. How can one's, say, revenue goal or patient goal relate to their marketing? How would you think that would dictate their marketing approach in the long run? So, like you mentioned earlier, going into marketing doesn't necessarily have to mean an upfront monetary investment. You may start, like what you mentioned, with the low-hanging fruit. I would say your initial thought process when you're doing marketing is let's grow a patient base and patient volume. How can I get a few more phone calls in with scheduling? How can I connect with patients that I already have and make them think about recommending me to their family and their other friends? Right. Um, and that's something that 
is not necessarily a straight monetary purchase, um, but starting that conversation. It's basically word of mouth that we were all taught in school as our primary marketing means. We have uh, three ways of looking at practices. Uh, the first one is fill the schedule. That's the name of the game. And all of your marketing activities should be geared towards anyone with a pulse. We want to bring them in. Phase two of that, I've got a pretty busy schedule now. About 80% of my schedule is filled on a regular basis. I'm now not looking at any patient, but specific kinds of patients, especially in areas of expertise, and preferably areas that earn me more revenue. Ortho K, vision therapy, specialty lenses, Dr. Lyle and I were talking about. So that's phase two. And then phase three, once you've mastered that, I've got a busy schedule with the types of patients I want. Phase three is really dominating the market. How am I the practice in my market and then there's a bunch of other people that also practice eye care. So I liked what you said about excluding the things to help define who you are. So what does that look like? I mean, you don't want to say, I've got a million different offerings and you know, pick one, but narrowing your focus as to what your practice is really bringing forth and then choosing that as your, as your marketing vehicle. So how does one practice, which offers a multitude of services, even begin to think about what do we really want to put into our marketing message through the medium? You know, do you break that down into like, okay, it's going to be a retail thing, a clinical thing, you know? I think you need to look at what you're passionate about as the provider. Because if you're not passionate about what you're posting about, it's going to really show through. So start there. If you, um, like what you mentioned, have a service area where you're like, oh, monetarily, it'd be really great if I could grow this venture then that's a clear focus. If you have multiple things that you're passionate about, it's going to be more organic for you if it's something that you keep feeling passionately about in optometry as your niche. Got it. We, we like to say to doctors, you need to be an expert at something. And the doctor will say, but I'm a general practitioner. The problem with that is that's not what Americans are interested in. I want to know what Oprah is reading. Why? Not because she's an expert reader, but she's a, a successful individual. She's great at something, and therefore all the other choices that she makes must also be great. So uh, there's a great story I was telling Dr. Lyerly uh, that we had a doctor out in San Diego uh, who was a pediatric keratoconus specialist, the head of the pin on the head of the pin. And we said, we're going to put a stake in the ground, and you are the expert in this nationally. And he said, that's, that's kind of scary. What about the rest of my business? A year later, he had to hire two more associates. His general optometry business exploded. His pediatric keratoconus business really stayed relatively the same. It's a market that can't grow that fast. But because he was an expert, obviously a very smart guy who knows a lot, and I want smart people taking care of my eyes. So doctors must pick something in order to paint themselves as an expert, because we as Americans, we're attracted to that. I want to be cared for by an expert. I think that's another good point. Look around your community and what's not being offered, because that's going to make the clicks come to you under that search engine optimization. So if you're not sure what you want to specialize in and you just love everything all the same, do a quick Google search in your area and see what's not being talked about. There's your inway. Okay, so now we say we've got this overall goal that we want to achieve, and we know how to break it down quarterly and communicate that with, that with our staff. Now we know how to exclude the things that we don't want to become. Maybe those things will come later down the line. And now it gets into the marketing vehicle approach. So let's pick up and start with Facebook, since you've already brought that up. What does the anatomy of a great Facebook post look like? What does it feel like? What kind of emotions does it convey? Well, I think you mentioned the key word right there is it's got to convey an emotion. If it looks like an advertisement, you're going to scroll right past because we see a ton of ads when we log on to Facebook and we don't actually look at them or pay any attention to them. So your post needs to look like something that connects with the person who's going to be looking on their page, like a friend's post or a family member's post. A picture is very important. If your post doesn't have an image, it's much more likely that you're going to scroll past. And ideally, the picture will either convey an emotion with an evocative image or be a picture of a person or a place that the person recognizes. So your office, you as the doctor, your staff, your local community, those kind of images are going to connect so much better than a stock photo that looks like an advertisement. Sure. I think a voice is also important. Sometimes people think that 
uh, I, I need to be who I am in person on my Facebook page. And especially when you're talking about using Facebook for marketing, develop a persona. So for I Care Pro, I'm the guy behind the scenes writing these things. And my persona online is a very tongue in cheek, a little sarcastic, a little humorous. I like to mock people a little bit, right? That's me. And when people meet me, they're always wondering who's the guy who's been writing the posts. And then when I say it's me, they have to do a double take. Yeah. What do you mean? But that's my, that's my voice online. Sure. And people start to buy into that like they do a storyline. It, it keeps me coming back for a little bit more. I think for the amateur, you know, someone who wants to get started with simple social media marketing, first we need to pick our platforms, right? And so you're the expert on this, but I would say, hands down, Facebook is a great place to start because you'll be able to capture multiple markets. I think personally, I've seen less patience on Twitter. Um, if you have a, a younger demographic, something like Snapchat works. And I think Instagram overall is rising to the top. So would you say Facebook, Instagram, that's really where you want to be? If you just do those two platforms, you're going to have your bases very well covered. About 75% of Americans are on Facebook, so that's a no-brainer. You really have to be there. And Instagram is really easy to connect with millennials through Gen X. Um, and honestly, if you're looking at something like Snapchat that's got a much higher barrier of entry, and the database of people who are using it primarily um, would be that Gen Z, much younger kind of teenager base, that's probably not the consumer that's immediately going to connect with your office and coming in to spend money anyway. Sure. Um, so using Facebook and Instagram, you're going to be covered with your overwhelming majority of the population that's making buying decisions. So, so when one is going to post here, I think when I was trying to get offices that I've worked at started on this, it's like, look, you don't need this amazing post. I think your patients would, get, would, would really enjoy a picture of your associate vacuuming the floors at the end of the day and how much you care about the cleanliness of the office or, you know, you got a new shipment of contact lenses in and you're unboxing them. People like to see behind the scenes of operations that seem so polished on the surface, but have a lot of moving parts underneath. So I like to say that Facebook is your bedside manner. Right. So if your website is saying, this is what I'm good at, this is what I clinically know, this is my expertise, Facebook is that place where it says, this is the guy you're going to meet. This is the person you're going to meet. And don't underestimate the importance of that. I've never had a patient say, I went to see Dr. Geller because do you know where he went to school? Did you see his marks? No. They usually say something like, I went to see Dr. Geller because he's such a nice guy. He's a great guy. What does that have to do with medicine? Everything. 100%. And that's the value of Facebook if you allow your person to come through. Drop the doctor talk. No ugly eyeballs on Facebook, please. It's a place to be social and be a person. And it's a, it's a great place to show who you are and why you should come see me as a doctor. So I think it's all about getting started and just taking, the, and, and like you said, use something photographic or use video within your content. I don't think it, it, it takes this enormous leap and bound or a planned campaign, snap a photo of your staff, write how much you guys are dedicated to the patients, just get it up there and watch the reaction and then iterate from there. I think just don't be too concerned about how perfect it looks. If it looks too perfect, it looks like an ad and that misses the whole point. So be natural, natural lighting, natural setting. You post that you post on your own personal social media. This is your office of social media. It can be just as relaxed. We have a program called Facebook Heroes. Most successful thing that we do on Facebook. Essentially, you uh, write five or six or eight questions. You hand them to your staff. Silly things like, what's the name of your pet? Where did you go to school? Where did you grow up? What's your favorite hobby? Tell me about your kids. And then we create posts out of them. They're personal, and they start with the number one Facebook users, the people in your office. Each one of those folks have Facebooks that are connected to other members of your community. So if your staff isn't on your Facebook page, you've, you've skipped a really important step. And the way to get them on Facebook page is to be writing about them. Mary brings in brownies every Friday, and there's a picture of Mary exactly. with the brownies. Very, very easy, very personable, and says a lot about the kind of office and the welcome that you get when you come to your office. What about frequency, though? How often should offices be posting? And if they're busy, what's the best recommended way to maybe pre-schedule those posts? Or any advice there for the busy office? How often and how to make it efficient? 
So you may disagree with me, but I, I really personally think a two to three posts a week is a good sweet spot. If you are connecting with local people, if you bombard their feed with a bunch of stuff, you again start looking like an advertiser and less like a family member and friend. Yeah. So you want to be careful to not oversaturate. Yeah, I was going to say two. So two. Okay. two to three is fine. <laughs> and, and I agree. I think you can get to the point where they don't want to hear from you that often. Put your time into quality instead of quantity. Write two really good posts, significantly better than five that looked like they were rushed out the door because you wanted to get the fifth one done? Uh, as far as scheduling, I mean, Facebook, you can pre-schedule your posts. You go ahead in there, you can write a whole month's worth if you want to, and you schedule when you want them to publish. So you don't even have to have an outsourced, outside application that you're paying for. Um, Hootsuite, for example, you can pre-plan a lot of your posting at once, but with Facebook, it's all internal. Right, exactly. So there's lots of other programs out there, Hootsuite, Buffer is another one. Um, so frequency take home there, two to three times a week, quality over quantity for sure. And then you could get into some advanced things down the road. And I think Facebook is probably has the best advertising system if you want to boost a post. So say that you find this post that's performing very well. You click that blue, you know, boost, boost me button, spend 20 bucks. And once you get into that um, next little window that pops up, you'll have the ability to target it to your patient demographic. So for example, it will ask you, where do you want to show the ad? So I could show it in San Diego, California within Pacific Beach if I'd like to. And then I could target different ages and demographics. So you can really get into the type of patient you want to see this, this post. And you can, you can target it to people who already like your page or you can acquire people who don't like your page yet. Um, and then you could go even deeper into posts that will get you phone calls and then start using those types of things. Any, any help on the ad side that we can offer folks? Uh, I've, I've seen reasonable results with it. I think it's a great idea. I think it's even a better idea when you're first starting out. It's a way to build your base. It's uh, build your community online. Ads can really take you beyond the folks that are currently getting it and then relying on them to share it and things like that. I think it's a great idea at the beginning. Got it. You have to be very specific with setting your audience because if you're not careful and you just say, everybody who's interested in eye care or something, for example, you will get fake follows and fake boosts and that's yep. piece of purpose. So you have to commit the time to saying who, where, when, what people and click all those buttons if you want real likes. So let's jump to, we're on the new age of marketing here. So right now in our hierarchy, we've discussed goals overall and planning them. Now we're talking about some of the new age digital marketing. Let's switch all the way to the other end of the spectrum of traditional marketing, meaning going door to door, print flyers, um, events. word of mouth marketing, event based marketing. So a lot of these things are not dead in any way, shape or form. And depending on your patient demographic, they still work very well. So any particular ones that you've done at your practice and seen success? One really successful thing that we've done at Triangle Visions Optometry in our community little suburbs or neighborhoods within Raleigh have these little individual magazines. They're free magazines you just pick up at the grocery store and they'll let you write op-eds in them about an eye care phenomenon or something like that. So dermatologists, your MDs, a lot of people have articles in there. It's a great way to communicate with your patient demographic and it's local only. It's also free. So that kind of kills two birds with one stone. Right. Uh, great experience with direct mail. We used to call it junk mail. Uh, it's really not any longer because we don't get six inches of mail every day in your mailbox. You get very little. And so because we get little, when I get a letter, it kind of makes me feel good and I read it. The choice in direct mail, however, is A, you can target your demographic, just like we've been talking about. So I can choose household ownership, income level, age, sex, and I can target that. If I'm doing something on the retail side of my business, then I'm going to use a postcard, something that's very graphic oriented. If I'm doing something more clinical, uh, we just did a big mailing on myopia control in the San Francisco area for a doctor. We're going to use a letter format, a number 10 envelope, black and white. It's a serious topic and we want them to open it up. They received a letter from a doctor. That's not a silly retail thing. It's a oh. serious message. So this goes back to why I brought up goals in the beginning. Who are you trying to become? Really, you got to confront that because now you're seeing the different types of ways that that is reflected in the medium you choose and the, the actual format of what you're providing. Another thing that's been really successful at the office where I work, they call it We Care Cards. 
These are for your existing patients, a patient that made a big impression in the exam room or that shared a personal story with you that really touched you. When you have a second during the day, write them a personal note. You can have your own office stationery, but that handwritten note, the patient's gonna be so surprised getting in the mail and you've just gone from doctor again to like a really personal connection. So we encourage our staff to do that too. In optical, they spend a lot of time with the person, for example. They made a, a multiple sale that day. Write them a thank you note and tell them how much you enjoyed learning about them. It means a lot to people to get letters in the mail like that. So getting started with a letter, which I did myself and, and, and mailed them out and took the time an hour after, at the end of every day, worked very well. I also sent an email to every single patient. And granted, it was a stock email at first. The trick that I would do is, you know how you can program different signatures in your email client. I just had one, two, and three, but when I selected the signature, it would actually populate an entire body of an email. So it would quickly pop it up. But then there was always a place that I would add something personal about the patient. So of course there was something standard in stock, but it always carried something personal about the day, the exam, the family, whatever it might be. That actually not only created a great trust between myself and the patient, but I actually found that recalls and having patients come in, they would just CC me on the email I sent one year before. So it was interesting to see that, and I'm not seeing patients anymore, but I still get these. And so it, it has a, a lifetime value almost, this email. So they can do postcards, they can do emails, people know how to do that, but how would one get started with print marketing? Where do you even begin? Well, again, Getting back to the original, you got to know your story first. Uh, I think dipping your toe in the water with uh, direct mail is a great opportunity. Uh, this brings up a really important point, which is measurement. Anything that you do, whether it's newspaper advertising, uh, print media, online work, uh, all needs to be geared towards your goal and how you're measuring yourself towards that. So as an example, with our websites that we do, we measure new patient appointments. We're, we're fanatical about that measure. When we're doing a direct mail piece, we're putting a special tracking phone number on there. Very, very simple, costs $2 a month to do. And now, every time that phone number rings, I know that it's from, generated from that postcard. Anything that goes out can have a tracking phone number on it to give me feedback on whether I should do that activity again. We're getting about a 1% return, which is very traditional on the direct mail side. Sometimes you're gonna get a little bit more, sometimes a little less, especially at the beginning. So when you're first starting your direct mail campaign, don't be discouraged if you're getting a half percent return or a quarter percent return, that will build over time. But you won't know that if you haven't put the appropriate tracking into place to give you feedback. So I was just talking to a doctor this morning and she said, well, I do a lot of newspaper advertising. I said, How, how's that going for you? And she said, great. No, how's that going for you? Like, what is it doing for you? She said, I have no idea. But it's really, it's a, it's a good ad and it looks good. And I said, okay, so here's just a tip. Start measuring it. Because it may be great. It may be killing it for you. On the other hand, it may be generating absolutely nothing. And that $400 a week can be diverted to something that might be generating business for you. So really, really important that all of these activities that we're talking about you start with how am I going to measure the success of it or not. Do you guys have any experience with Google Ads? AdWords? So, you know, the largest advertiser in the world is essentially Google. It makes up the majority of their revenue and it's, their product is called Google AdWords. And you can type in Google AdWords to get started with Google AdWords. If you're really not computer savvy, I would suggest trying Google AdWords Express. It's a slimmed down version of Google AdWords. And essentially, the reason that this product is so powerful is because Google understands what you're searching for. So when you search for something, they'll serve you up ads in line with the other content that you're seeing to drive home a success at the end of the day. So for a practice, this may look like I go on and I'm saying, do I have cataracts? And the first ad that pops up can be for the keyword around cataracts in, say, Raleigh, North Carolina, that you've targeted for that where it will say, Dr. Lyerly's practice, you know, I know you're not focused on cataract care necessarily, but you know, cataract assessments, call now. That Google builds in the call tracking for you so you can see overall how many clicks have occurred. You can set it to mobile, desktop, depending on the ad you want. And this is, if you think about it, a really great way. We, we all click on the Google ads sometimes because they're not in your face. They seem valuable. The message seems very specific to what you're doing. So would you recommend that to practices? 
Um, I recommend that especially when you're starting a new service. Uh, I'm launching a dry eye service in my practice. I'm trying to get it off the ground. I want to draw some attention to it. I think Google AdWords is a great idea. Again, make sure you're measuring uh, and make sure you have some patience with that. So I speak to doctors who say, yeah, I, I did a month of Google AdWords, it didn't work. And the reason is because you did a month <laughs> of Google AdWords. You've really got to have a longer term view on it uh, and then evaluate along the way. So if you're at month four, month five, and you're not seeing real results, that's not going to be a good tool for you and you want to shift, again, shift that budget over to some other mechanism that may start to yield that. I agree, it's all about what you choose to bid on as far as the AdWords. It's got to be something nuanced and niche, otherwise, the large players in your community will outbid you. They are spending a lot more money on Google AdWords than you. So don't waste your money on eyewear or sunglasses. It's a waste of money. But if you're doing pediatric keratoconus, that's a dime well spent, I'm sure. Yep. And, and, and you want to make sure when they click this ad, they're going to a page that's relevant. You don't want to just send them to your home page and it's like, this did nothing for me. Now I need to search even further. The point of this ad to go is to, is to go where I need to go, whether it's booking an appointment, um, reading more about the doctor, whatever it is. And so we use Google Ads with the companies behind us here, and they do tremendously well. But it will work almost, even, I believe, even better for a local practice where you can really target 25 miles around your area for you know a certain set of criteria. So don't be afraid of those things. It may be that you need to work with a more professional service to get it started. Um, but why don't you just try Googling, I need an eye exam, and seeing who in your area is bidding on those keywords and winning. Right. Maybe I just go talk to them. I think you also have to be careful. Uh, the Google AdWords attract a very high amount of traffic. Don't, be, uh, don't fall for the illusion of traffic equaling business. It doesn't. And uh, I know company marketing companies out there that say, I'm going to double your traffic, and this is how they do it. On the other hand, it's sometimes a poorer quality of traffic, and therefore, it doesn't necessarily have a one-to-one -one correlation with new business. So you want to make sure that your ground-level marketing is still in place, and you're not relying totally on Google AdWords. Uh, they're great at the beginning because they give you a nice little bump but it's not a necessarily a high quality of return. Yeah. Now, I think the holy grail is word of mouth marketing. You know, someone's real, honest, this is my word behind it. How do you hack into that? How do you even start there? Obviously, you can say, patient X, patient Y, can you please give me a referral? Any way to generate it automatically? So I'm gonna call out a friend that's in the crowd, but Florian at Alchemy Marketing, He's really opened my eye up, and I'm sure you do this at iCare Pro too. Reviews is a great word of marketing source. And I've seen estimates that Google SEO kind of counts about 10% towards Google reviews. So ask your patient or have a software system set up that drives internal reviews and then encourages your patients to post them, especially when they're good. Try to keep the bad reviews internal. Yep. The, the other thing is, uh, think about every patient that's coming through your office today as a potential marketer walking out of your office, if and only if they're equipped. So uh, we like to tell optometry stories one very small chapter at a time, and we take a month to do that. So this month we're talking about presbyopia in Dr. Geller's practice, and his receptionist is going to be handing out material on presbyopia to every single person that is walking out the door of his office. And you say, but that was a 25-year-old woman coming in to have her eyes, eyeglasses uh, done. Uh, why are you giving her presbyopia material? Because she has a brother, she has a father, she has a boyfriend, she has other people in her life that may have this. And you want to arm her with that story. Uh, and we've seen tremendous results by giving people the appropriate message that you're doing this this month uh, and and they become a marketer for you out in their little part of your community another really good way to do that if you have a patient who is picking up their new glasses they just love their new glasses ask them oh when you post that online will you tag us in it just a simple ask you don't even have to be running a contest necessarily or promise a giveaway of course if you do that that's going to drive those posts even more i love that but just asking them tag us when you post that drives all of their family and friends that comment and like their picture back to your practice and it's really easy free marketing 
Let's get into what your favorite little marketing hacks are. I think marketing at the end of the day is all a little bit of hackiness until you find something that works and then stick with it. And some of the most creative opportunities in marketing come about from certain creative ideas that are kind of hacky in a way. Um, one of the things that I was doing was going around and in essentially every place that I shopped that seemed to have a public presence, I said, can I come and speak here? So a local pharmacy, a local holistic pharmacy, um, there's a grocery store, uh, Jimbo's in San Diego, that does these types of talks. And that led into further talks or, or me discovering lunch and learns at large companies, engineering companies like Raytheon and, and that type of stuff. And I would just start cold calling HR people in the community and saying, hey, do you realize that all your employees are sitting in front of screens with crazy amount of blue light, damage to their eyes, and getting them all intrigued, and then eventually lead to a lunch and learn. So in-person talks were a very big hack that grew into something more sustainable. What do you guys find is a nice little marketing hack that people can try? So the mine's more about social media a little bit, but um, one of the easiest ways to drive traffic to your social media accounts is to post in local restaurants. I know in Raleigh, and I'm sure other places, foodie culture is huge. And if you take Ira from your store and post it beside some sort of amazing looking meal from a local business, tag that business, tag yourself. You can even direct message the company or the local business and say, hey, I've tagged you. Would you mind resharing this on your account if they don't immediately do it, which a lot of times they will without you even asking them. Um, and you get access to all of their followers and all of their friends on social media. So that's a quick and easy one. People are just gonna stop and look at food posts. Put your glasses beside of it. It's funny that you bring that up because our uh, most successful campaign for eye care is Valentine's Day. Makes no sense whatsoever, but uh, what we do is we have the doctors uh, give away a free uh, meal at a restaurant nearby. The restaurant promotes it, the doctor promotes it, and it's a huge win for both, and they've been these incredibly successful campaigns. And the, the doctor will tie it to either like my Facebook page or come in for an appointment, uh, and that's how you get on the, the list to be chosen, and then they pull a name out of the hat, and it's a hugely successful program. My uh, hack, though, however, is um, I'm a big maps guy. I don't know anybody who loves maps, I love maps. I love maps. So when I'm talking to a doctor, I have to have the map in front of me of your office. I need to see where you live, where, what you look at. And there was a doctor whose uh, office backed up onto a Home Depot. And so I said, have you ever gone over to the Home Depot and talk to the manager? And he said, about what? And I said, about protective eye care. And you know, everybody at Home Depot is over 40. They all need prescription protective eyewear. So walk over there and say to him that you're willing to give him a, I don't know, a 10% discount for him to send his employees uh, over to you for eye care. He had six the first week. Wow. And it, it just stayed two or three people a week came over every week. It was the most successful thing he did. And all he did was go over and shake hands with the manager and introduce himself. No different than what you were doing. Sure. Not a speaker, so he wouldn't have volunteered that. But he was comfortable enough to go over and say, I think I can help your employees out. And you get to be a hero because you're going to give them a little bit of a discount. Yeah, that's phenomenal. What are some of the keys to getting, and, and I think, I don't, I don't know the right way to ask this, but let's talk trunk shows. Getting people in your practice, community events, whether they're catered, how do you make a trunk show fun? I mean, I've seen trunk shows triple, quadruple normal revenue for a day. You can walk away with 10, 15, some serious bucks. How do you organize one? Have you ever done one? I, again, it's like all about the branding. I think. The best person I've ever seen have a trunk show is Tanya Gill of Oakland Vision Center. If you guys follow her on uh, social media, you'll know what I'm talking about. Her big trunk show, it's got this hashtag event, glasses, donuts, uh, glasses, donuts, love. That's what it is. And so she has pictures of donuts everywhere. There's a selfie station to take your picture with donuts. She has donut glasses. And the thing is just a huge community event. Um, I think having some sort of brand around your trunk show that engages the community, whether you have a mascot for a local club there, or you're also doing concussion discussion at that place. I mean, there's so many different ways you could go, but have it say something, not just trunk show, have it be about something bigger message. I love that. Yeah, and I'm a big fan of screenings. I think the, the idea of bringing people in for the beginning part of an exam, 
Uh, dry eye, we've been doing a lot of dry eye screenings lately, but glaucoma, uh, myopia, things that have a process afterwards, right? You're not gonna screen for refraction. You're gonna pick something that requires the ability to come in and get a little bit of information. And what you'll find is that people self-select. So you're not gonna find a lot of false negatives, people coming in to be part of a screening that don't have the problem. They're coming in because they think they do. And so the percentage of people that you'll actually keep as a result of that screening is very, very, very high. They feel that they've gotten something for free, and they have, but really what they've done is they've gotten an appointment. Uh, and you've given away a little bit of time to do that. Hold it on a Saturday, book it, make sure people have appointments for that screening, so they're coming in at 8.15, 8.30, quarter of nine, and it's been hugely successful for us. What are the biggest wastes of marketing that you see, you know, really where are people kind of flushing money down the toilet, or not even that, maybe it's time down the toilet, or just they are flushing opportunity down the toilet. Like, where do you really see that that's happening? What are most practices just straight up doing wrong? I think I see a lot of people that say, oh, we have an active Facebook account. And then I look at it and it's uh, the vision source images or the all about vision images. Those are free. Or well, if vision source, you're, part, you're getting it as part of your thing. Sure. That, that shouldn't count as your marketing message. If you think that's your marketing message, it is not successful. It's not going to connect. So don't assume that just because you have a free service or you belong to a service that offers marketing, that that's really marketing for you. You've got to do more, it sounds like. Yellow pages. <laughs> Yellow pages. Oh, my God. Yeah. I Yellow we were pages. Done with that. Yellow pages are dead. I don't know if anybody still gets the book, but it, they're, they're dead. And they try to convert their business over, uh, and it's, it's a disaster. If you, I'm sorry if you have it, but uh, if you go down that path, you'll never escape. They'll never let you out of the contract. <laughs> you will sign a contract, which rule one is, if you're at, being asked to sign a contract for service, step away. Yep. Because if the service doesn't compel you to stay, why do you need a piece of paper? Sure. Uh, you, none of you guys get to ask your patients for a contract. I'm sorry, if you, if you want eyeglasses from me, you'll have to sign a three-year agreement. <laughs> you can't. They come back because you do a great job. And the same is true for any marketer. Yellow Pages asks for a 12-month agreement, and when you go to quit, they'll just keep billing you. And, and it's, a, it's, it's a really bad situation. But that's, that's the big no-no for me. It probably happens way more than we think. So in the interest of time, let's try to wrap up with, and we could take some time with this, but what is, if you were to tie the perfect package with a nice bow on it, of what a practice can really start doing today to increase their marketing 10x, because that's the name of this talk. And you see, that's pretty markety right there, because I don't know if it's 10x, but I got you to come here. So um, what would you do? And maybe I'll start so you guys can think, because you didn't know this question was coming. But so what does it look like? I would say if a practice is going to start with marketing, you'd try to, you'd want something of each flavor, right? I want a piece of social media marketing a piece of online marketing, just website, something a little bit more traditional online, something in print, and something where I'm shaking hands. So I think for social, that would be Facebook. That's where I put my money. I think they've got the best bang for the buck if you do ads. Online, I think most practices have a website, but it's very rare that you're seeing people blogging. Now, I love blogging, and it's what really got me sitting here in the first place, but writing content, specifically content that's unique to your area, for example, I used to write articles about why San Diegans had more dry eye than people in LA. And guess who would read it? People from San Diego, because it was keyword search for that and no one had ever wrote that article. So creating a blog. On the print side, I think I would probably look to some expert to help me make the right flyer with the right graphic. Personally, I, I would just do it, but I think for the majority of people, you gotta find someone to do a great graphic design for you, a service that's gonna help you just get it out there and send it out with postage, et cetera. Um, and then the last one being find ways to do in-person events. Go around to local businesses, offer a lunch and learn, go around to local supermarkets, health food stores, whatever it is, and speak on a topic for 30 to 45 minutes. You do not need to be Paul Carpecki to talk about eye care disease. You can help these consumers with very general stuff. Shout out to Paul. Um, so that would be my unique marketing package there. What, what about you? I would say just stop. 
Don't do anything. Oh. Yeah. Don't don't pick up Facebook. Don't don't even go online yet. And just ask yourself, who am I? Who do I, who would I want this business to be? Maybe it's not what you've always been. You might have an established practice, but it's gotten stale in the marketing department. It's time to really focus on a brand identity and tell a unique and individual story. And that might take some time to figure out who you are and what you want to be. But it's got to start there to make anything else you do in marketing make any sense and have any value for you. So brainstorm, write down on a piece of paper what you do best, what you really love about optometry, and let that start speaking to you about who your practice really is. I'll dig a little deeper there. How do you get your staff on board with that? Because I feel like part of that comes from them, right? So when I, I had the luxury at Triangle Visions Optometry to sit in on a branding kind of session, if you will. The practice had been around since the 70s, okay? But it was growing and we wanted to kind of rebrand our identity. And they had associate doctors, managers, technicians, optical staff, all of them participate in what their idea for the practice was, who they wanted to be, what's the vision of the practice, what's the mission statement, and write out those things. And then we all sat down within a brainstorming group and kind of talked about what we liked from other people's ideas, and it became the entire brand story of the practice. So absolutely get them involved. And that seems to, that, that sounds like it would help for everyone's buy-in on the idea. Everyone feels invested in it, which is important for the idea to ever even, you know, see the light of day. How about you, Michael? Uh, number one, uh, optometry and medicine in general is, a, is an intimate sport. Uh, I'm about to have a relationship with you, and, and doctors need to recognize that. So therefore, I need to feel comfortable and confident about you. Uh, the story is you. It, it really is, and I go to doctors' websites, and I see that they've got a grumpy picture or, or a picture that's clearly old. And, and I say, wow, that's really what I'm about to make my decision on. So please make sure your, any photographs that you have, whether in the, their brochures or on your website, make sure they're up to date and make sure they convey whatever it is that you want to convey, whether that's warmth or being positive or being competent, but understand that that's where people are making their decision. The second big thing that I, I see a mistake made is your office is one of your biggest marketing tools whether it's laid out a particular way, whether it's clean, do you provide water or coffee when people are sitting in the lobby? The, the gestalt of your office is what people walk out with. I, had, I used to run a hospital in Nashville, and uh, I believe that my most important person in the entire facility was my receptionist. This woman was the uh, cousin of Dolly Parton. She was oh. about four foot seven, and then her hair made up the rest of... Uh, another foot or so. <laughs> this lady was deadly. She was deadly effective. I once was behind the desk and I was putting some files away and uh, a man walked in. His daughter had been admitted to a psychiatric facility. Uh, he was very, very, very upset. His, he and his wife were estranged. And she said in the best Southern accent I had ever heard, sweetie, you look hungry. Let me get you some dinner. She pushed that man out from behind the desk, sat him down, took his shoes off, put his feet up on a cassock, went over the cafeteria and brought him out dinner. And I know that my mouth was wide open the entire time. That's she amazing. managed this guy like nobody's business. By the time this was all done, this guy came over and apologized for the way that he had stormed into the hospital. And he said, if you could help me out, I'd really appreciate it. And I was just, what do you need to be paid for that <laughs> skill? But, but really, that experience is invaluable. You can't put a price on it. And yet it is that thing that people are going to be walking out with. So I think we're just hitting our stride now, which is unfortunate. So you will have to see a Vision Expo West. Um, it sounds like the one thing that unifies all of these, and I think the biggest mistake, is you need to take time. You have to take time to put towards this an effort. And so if anyone's watching this, on, it'll be on YouTube and things like that. Take a Saturday, get all your staff in, buy some breakfast, get the whiteboard out and start thinking of ideas. And then take another Saturday to do the same thing and refine it. Come up with your plan and execute it. And then see really what it looks like. Did you hit that goal that we spoke about in the beginning? And I think you'll find that you did. And I think that a lot of folks have the power to do great marketing 
and it, it, you're going to just have to put the time towards it. So, I have a plug. Go for it. Uh, free strategic planning ebook on our website, iCarePro.net. Uh, it comes with both a one-page planner as well as a 55-page book that you can leaf through for ideas. I love it. Not, they're not all good ideas. About 54 pages are good, but 55th <laughs> page is not so good. But uh, seriously, it's a great tool, and then you need to select what's right for you. I love that, and I definitely want to give, uh, just as we go through here, contact information for all of us and where they can utilize your resources. So, Michael, iCarePro.net. What else? iCarePro.net. Uh, Michael at iCarePro.net, best way to reach me and uh, happy to work with you. We do a lot of free stuff on our website, lots and lots, and there's a trick to it. We provide you with free stuff so that you become so busy that you will have to outsource your marketing at some point, yep. and who are you gonna outsource it to but the guy that helped you get there. So <laughs> it is a tactic, you are being tricked uh, with all this free stuff. How about you, Jen? So uh, you can email me at defocusmedia at gmail.com. Our website is defocusmedia.com. Look, uh, Daryl Glover and I are uh, optometrists. This is something that we do as a side project, it's our passion. And we are here for you. Just if you want to talk it out online, email us. You can hit us up on Instagram or on Facebook. Um, we're happy to help however you want us to help, whether it's just asking us a question or looking to branch into social media services. But we're really just for ODs. We care about ODs, and we're ODs too. Love it. And I could put my word behind both of these folks, uh, use their services, worked with them, and they're both really uh, aces. Um, with us, you can view all of this content online at newgradoptometry.com. If you have staffing nightmares and headaches, covalentcareers.com. Get on the phone with us. Everything we do is immensely and insanely personal. And we're there for you. So any way we can help, let us know. And there's a lot more of these coming out. So um, thank you, everyone, for attending. <laughs>